text tonight, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 12 through 18. Tonight we want to talk about sowing spiritual dandelions. Sowing spiritual dandelions. I don't know if, if you enjoyed it as much as I did growing up, but I enjoyed blowing dandelions. It was a lot of fun. I don't know that I fully understood what I was doing at the time. I have a feeling that I created a great deal more work for my father when he didn't really need for me to do that. Because I was blowing those dandelions, I was spreading seeds all over our yard. I was creating more fun for me, but more work for him. You know, spiritually speaking, we can do the same thing. If we're not careful in the way that we use our tongues, the way that we use our mouths, we can create a great deal more work for other people. We can make their lives more difficult than what they ought to be and than what they have to be. And so we need to be extremely careful that we don't make more work for our Heavenly Father and His kingdom by not handling things as we ought to. We can sow some spiritual dandelions and cause a great deal of problems. It seems to me that that is what Solomon has in mind in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 12 through 18. And I don't know that he specifically was thinking about dandelions or not. He might have been thinking about something else and sowing other seeds. Uh, but the truth certainly applies. We're supposed to be sowing wheat, but if we're not careful, we can be sowing weeds. We can be sowing that which competes with the wheat, and that which, in fact, can choke out the wheat if we're not careful. Now, let's look at the context beginning in verse 12 and simply read down through the context, because we're going to be referring to it again and again. Beginning in verse 12, A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers." Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Now, it seems to me that this context is focused on one central thing. In fact, the thought comes up uh, two times. It comes up in the first division of verses, verses 12 through 15, and then it comes up again in verses 16 uh, through 19. And there, that is this idea of sowing discord. The idea, if you will, of sowing spiritual dandelions. Maybe we can do that at times without even meaning to. Maybe we can do that at times without even knowing what we're doing. Kind of like a child with a dandelion. Uh, but other times, I think it's more um, deliberate than that. Other times, I think it's done fully realizing, fully understanding what is happening or what is taking place. It's not innocent childhood fun, but rather it's a very serious and very damaging matter. As we take a look at these verses, we want to consider three things. We want to consider, first of all, the person. That has to do with the person who does this sowing. Then we want to take a look at the process. That is how this sowing takes place. And then finally, we want to take a look at the punishment, and that is what happens to the person who does this. Solomon covers all of these points. Let's begin by talking about the person. Notice that Solomon identifies the person who is responsible for sowing spiritual dandelions. Notice how he identifies him in verse 12. He identifies him as a naughty person, a wicked man walketh with a froward mouth. Two major descriptions, naughty and wicked, are used to describe this man. And these words are words that are rich in meaning. They're, they're words that have a great deal to tell us about this man. 
We can pass over them rather quickly. We can just see them on the surface and not really understand what Solomon's trying to say. But let's take a closer look at these words. The word naughty can mean this, worthlessness. Here is a man who is worthless. Here is a man who is not, according to the definition, good for anything. He's good for nothing. Why? Because he's not using his talents, his abilities to produce wheat. He's producing spiritual dandelions. He's doing the opposite of that. Notice that Baker and Carpenter suggest that the term is applied to the hard-hearted. Uh, there is a condition of heart that goes with this. The context clearly identifies the heart as being the root of the problem. It's a word used to refer to perjurers, those who willingly deceive. Notice it's used of those who promote rebellion, whether it's rebellion against the king's authority or whether it's rebellion against God's authority. Think for a moment about Absalom and think about what Absalom did. Absalom's the ultimate example of sowing discord in Israel. You remember that Absalom stood at the gate where people came in and out. They were coming to see David, but Absalom never let them get there. Absalom met them at the gate. Absalom said to them at the gate, oh, oh, David's too busy. David's got too much going on. Just let me help you. Just let me do this for you. Perhaps David knew it was happening. Perhaps David didn't. I think probably as time moved along, David must have known uh, that it was happening. Perhaps David was more tolerant than what he should have been. Perhaps David had the idea, oh, it's, it, it'll correct itself. Or maybe David had the idea, you know, he's my son. And I don't like it and it's not good, but... David tended to be tolerant as a parent. We see some problems in his family because he was that way. Maybe that's what the situation was. Or maybe it was simply that David really was busy. It wasn't that David didn't care about them. No, he cared about them very much. It was simply that David had a kingdom to run. David had a great deal to do. He didn't have the discretionary time that Absalom must have had. Why? Absalom's a prince. Absalom has all the money he wants. Absalom has all the time he wants. Absalom, Absalom has all the influence that he wants. David's got a kingdom to run. He's got business to do. Absalom knew that, and Absalom took advantage of that. He fits the definition here of one that promoted rebellion against the king and ultimately against God, because David had been selected by God. He was God's selected one to rule this kingdom. It happens in the church today, right? It happens in the church today where individuals promote rebellion against the elders. When individuals promote individuals to rebel against the authority that God has placed within the eldership. It happens today when men rebel openly against the authority of God. Absalom certainly is an example of one who did that. Also, Baker and Carpenter suggest of this word that in the Greek, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then later in the New Testament, that it is used to refer to the devil. It's a word literally used of the devil. And if you think about the devil, and you think about who the devil is, and you think about what the devil does... The, the devil is the enemy that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 13 that comes and sows tares among the wheat. That's what the devil does. You remember that a man went forth into the field and the man sowed good seed. He knew what he sowed. He knew he sowed good seed. But his servants came and he said, they said, where did the tares come from? We didn't sow that kind of seed. Where did this come from? And you remember that this man was told this. This man was told that an enemy must have done that. While men slept, the enemy came in and sowed these seeds. Now, why would an enemy do that? Why would an enemy do that? If an enemy wants to grow tares, why doesn't he just plant his own field of tares? Why does he come into your wheat field and sow them? 
Well, he sows them in the wheat field because he wants that to be competitive with the wheat. You see, the tares compete with the wheat for the nutrients and the things in the soil. But beyond that, the tares get so intertwined among the wheat that in trying to deal with the tares, sometimes you pull up the wheat. You remember the servants wanted to go and pull up the tares. That was a lot of work, but these servants said, let's go pull up the tares, let's go get them out. And you remember the master said, oh, no, 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 you're not going to be able to do that, because if you do that, you'll destroy the wheat. The enemy knew that. And so the enemy sowed these tares to be competitive. The enemy sowed, sowed these tares to be destructive, to be frustrating. Sowed these tares to ultimately affect the wheat, and whether or not the wheat was saved or lost. Serious, serious matter. But the devil was the one that was doing that. And so this word is used in reference to the devil. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 4 refers to a naughty tongue. It refers to the evil man and a naughty tongue connects the two. We'll see connections between uh, these things, the tongue, the lips, the mouth being involved in all of these sins. In James chapter 1 and verse 21, it's a passage that we quote quite often, but we don't really think about what it's saying. James 1.21 says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness, and notice this, and superfluity of naughtiness. When we obey the gospel, we as Christians are supposed to put aside filthiness. We're supposed to put aside naughtiness. That's not supposed to be a part. And notice that James talks about the superfluity of naughtiness, literally the overflowing of naughtiness, because that's what naughtiness tends to do. It tends to overflow. And so we're supposed to lay that apart. Certainly Solomon was giving that advice here. But the second word that's used to describe this man, not only is he described as a naughty person, but he's described as a wicked man, verse 12. The word wicked carries some of the same ideas, so we don't have to spend as much time on it. A part of the definition means nothingness. You remember we suggested that this man was a naughty man, he was good for nothing, he was worthless because he wasn't using himself to do the right thing, so he was of no value. The same idea contained in the word wicked, but it also carries with it the idea of trouble, sorrow, evil, mischief. All of these things are connected with this man. And so in Proverbs 2 and verse 12, the son of Solomon, Solomon's son, was being taught wisdom that they might be able to deliver him from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. Again, we see the connection. Proverbs 4 and verse 16, Solomon said concerning this man, they sleep not except they've done mischief. Their sleep is taken away unless they cause someone to fall. Now, now, he's describing him. He says they can't go to bed at night. They can't sleep at night unless they've, they've sown this during the day. They wouldn't be able to rest if they had not put in a, a day's work, and this is their work. Psalm 52 and verse 3 states it this way. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than speaking righteousness. Loving evil more than good, loving lying more than speaking righteousness. Some of you are familiar with the southern comic humorist Jerry Clower. And you probably are familiar at least with some of the stories that he used to tell. And one of the stories that he used to tell was about New Gene Ledbetter. If you remember anything about New Gene. Well, the story was on Eugene that he would climb a tree to be able to tell you a lie, then he would stand on the ground and tell you the truth. Now, we know some people like that. We know some people who love lying rather than truth. We know some people who, who love evil rather than good, and, and they were around in Solomon's day, and they're around in our day. That's what Solomon's talking about. Acts chapter 13 and verse 10. I, I love this example because it really captures it uh, in a New Testament example. You may remember that Paul was busy converting. And he converted a man by the name of Bar-Jesus. 
And there was one named Elymas, who was a sorcerer who sought to turn him away from the faith. Here Paul sowed truth in this man's life. It was producing fruit. But then an enemy, Elymas, came and sowed tares in his heart that he might overturn, overthrow the wheat. And Paul was going to have none of that. And Paul punished him as a result of his actions. But here's an example of one who was naughty. Uh, one who was wicked. Here's the way he's described. Full of all subtlety, all mischief. Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. One who perverted the right ways of the Lord. That's what Solomon's talking about. One full of mischief. One who's a child of the devil. One who's an enemy of all that's right. One who's perverting what God would have. So there's the person. But now let's talk about the process. As we look at the process in Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, take a look just at verses 12 through 15 and mark the action words. Mark the verbs in this context. A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a froward mouth. He winketh with his eyes. He speaketh with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Now think about all of these verbs here. Verbs are action words. And so here's a person who is very, very active. But they're not active in sowing good, they're active in sowing evil. But notice the words, notice the language that's used in this passage to describe their activity. Now let's use the illustration of the dandelion and use the illustration of blowing the seeds of that dandelion. We picked it up and we blew it. And we watched the seeds go out. Could the seeds have gotten out on their own without any help from us? Sure. That's the way a dandelion's designed, right? The wind can blow them. The wind can carry them about. But we can speed along that process. We can hurry it up. We can make sure it gets done. That's the person here. They make sure it gets done. Might happen anyway. They're not going to leave anything to chance. They're going to make sure that it happens. Discord travels in much the same way that those seeds travel. The Bible says of the devil in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant. Literally, be sober, be active. Now, there's a reason why the Bible tells us to be active. Do you know what it is? Because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, walketh about... Notice the language of this passage. A wicked man walketh with a froward mouth. The devil walks about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is extremely active. And so if we're going to combat him, we're going to be as, have to be as active as what he is. We sometimes make the point that the devil doesn't take a day off, and he doesn't. He's busy, he's active, he's always looking for an opportunity. We have to be active and busy and on guard at all times as well. Now think about the ETH on the end of these words, and that's one of the reasons why I love the King James. I love the King James because it's faithful and it's sound and it's proven, stood the test of time. But one of the reasons why I like the King James is because I'm not that good in the Greek. But the King James helps me. It helps me in the Hebrew and it helps me in the Greek by identifying certain tenses to let me know that the word that's being used describes an ongoing action. And the King James uses the ending ETH to do that. And so these actions on the part of this naughty, wicked person are not one-time actions. They're ongoing actions. He walketh. He winketh. He, he speaketh, he teacheth, he deviseth, he soweth. These are ongoing actions. He does them again and again and again. Now take a look at this as well. The more you look at this, the more you see, and we're only going to touch the hem of the garment tonight. But as we look at verses 12 through 14, let's take a look at how this is sown. Let's take a look at how this, the process by which this is done. 
And as we look at the process by which this is done, it's interesting to me that it is done both verbally and non-verbally. I, I guess I've always considered that discord is sown verbally. Discord is sown by what you say. But according to Solomon, that's just a part of it. You can sow discord, evidently, according to Solomon, based on this list, without saying a word. You can sow discord through a look, through a wink, Solomon says, you can sow discord. You can sow discord with your feet, not just with your mouth. So there's more than one way to do it. There's verbal and non-ways to do it. And if you, if you look at Jeremiah, for example, Jeremiah will talk about preaching to his people and he'll talk about the looks that he got. And I have a feeling that they were looks that were against what he was preaching. And so that may very well qualify for what Solomon's talking about right here. But ultimately, this is what Solomon says. And it's true of everything. Someone has said that the heart of the problem is what? A problem of the heart. You want to get to the heart of any problem, where do you have to get to? You have to get to the heart. And so it is with this. Notice he says in the context, Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. This is an inward thing. It's in his heart. It's a problem of the heart. It takes place in the mind. He deviseth mischief. That's where it takes place. Proverbs 23 and verse 7, the Bible says, As a man thinketh, where? In his heart. So is he. That's this man. He's this way because of the way he thinks. If he changes thinking, he changes, changes life. Think about 1 Timothy 5 and verse 13. An illustration of what's being talked about here. Paul wanted to make sure that widows were taken care of. Widows were in a very desperate position in the first century world. If they didn't have anyone to care for them, then they, they were in a very difficult circumstance, and Paul wanted to make sure that they were cared for. But he had certain rules. The older ones were to be cared for, but the younger ones, they had another alternative. They had a way of providing for themselves. They had a way, and, and part of the way of providing for themselves was to marry and have someone help them. Those that were older may not have had that option. And so he's concerned about the younger widows. And he says, and with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I want you to make a comparison. I don't know if you've ever done this or not. First Timothy 5 and verse 13 contains the expression house to house. You know, there's another passage in the Bible that contains that same expression. Acts 20 and verse 20. These younger women were going house to house with bad news. But the early Christians, Acts 20 and verse 20, were going house to house with good news. In Matthew chapter 13, you read of the parable of the sower, but you also read of the parable of what? Of the tares. Jesus is a sower, but so is the devil. There are those who carry the gospel about, but there are also who carry other things about. The Bible identifies both. Think about Proverbs chapter 16, verses 28 through 30. Solomon hits on it a little bit harder in this context. Notice again the action involved. A froward man soweth strife. Not discord this time, it's strife. A whisper separateth chief friends. A violent man enticeth his neighbor, leadeth him into the way that's not good. He shutteth his eyes to devise forward things. Moving his lips, he bringeth evil to pass. Notice the ETH, notice the verbs. Again, action, 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 action. He's going house to house, but not with good things, but with bad things. But maybe this was the most amazing discovery that I think I made of all that I made in studying this context, because I've read it many, many times. But if you compare the first section, verses 12 through 15, with the second section, verses 16 through 19, 
you see an amazing parallel between things. I have always thought of these six things, yea, seven things that God hates as, as being an individual list of different sins, kind of sins that really have no necessary connection to one another, just things that the Lord hates. But the more that I read through this list, I'm convinced that there's a common thread that runs through all of them. I don't think he's talking about six or seven individual sins. He's talking about one sin that, that, that has these six or seven components to it. Many times in the book of Proverbs, he'll say, yea, for three and for four. Here he says, for six, yea, for seven. The idea is that three fills it up, four causes it to run over. Six fills it up, seven causes it to run over. And so the one that's put last, there's a great deal of emphasis on it because it's the one that makes everything overflow. Now take a look at the list and see what's last. He that soweth discord among brethren. But when you go back up in the context, notice the last one in verse 14. He soweth discord. I think there's a connection. But let's take a look at the list. Very quickly, look at the list with me and see if, see if you don't see the same thing that I'm seeing. Verse 12 talks about a froward mouth. Then when we begin down in the context of these six things the Lord hates, we have a lying tongue and a false witness that speaketh lies. Are those things not parallel? We have mouth, tongue. We have mouth and speaketh. There seems to be a parallel there. We have in verse 12, walketh with a froward mouth. Verse 13, we have speaketh with his feet. Again, the feet are the emphasis. Then in verse 18, we have feet that be swift in running to mischief. Seems to me to be a parallel. Verse 13, winketh with his eyes. Verse 18, a proud look. Verse 13, teacheth with his fingers. Notice the fingers. And then in verse 18, hands that shed innocent blood. You say, well, how, how, does, how does hands that shed innocent blood have anything to do with this idea of discord? Just read the account of Jezebel and Naboth and you'll understand. Jezebel slew innocent blood when she killed Naboth. Naboth didn't do anything wrong. But Jezebel, through what she said about Naboth, had Naboth killed. She said innocent blood, but it was connected with the discord that Jezebel spoke about Naboth. Notice as well, other, uh, other parallels. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. Verse 14. We have a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Verse 18. And then verse 14. So with discord. In verse 19. So with discord. So we see these parallels that exist between these two lists. I don't think they're, they're a different list. I think one's just an elaboration of the other one. God's just emphasizing it again within the context exactly what he's talking about. And so we've seen the person who's naughty, who's wicked. We've seen the process by which this goes about, uh, a very active process of, of walking and teaching and speaking and devising and sowing and all of this action that's involved in this. Now we want to take a look at the punishment. Look at the context of what he says. In verse 15, it says, Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly... Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. Now, as an illustration of that, just kind of on the front end, how did Absalom's destruction come? One day, Absalom is in the gate, stealing away the hearts of the people. The next day, he's driven David from his own city. There was the day when Absalom's forces were winning the day. But how quickly did it come to an end for Absalom? Absalom went underneath the branches of a tree and his beautiful hair got caught. And the mule that he was riding on kept on going, but he didn't. And Absalom was suspended between heaven and earth. And guess who happened to come along that way? Good old Joab. 
And Joab knew just what to do. And Joab allowed his servants to have some fun with Absalom before Absalom ultimately dies. Think about how quickly Absalom came to the top, but think about how quickly Absalom went down to the bottom. That's what this passage is talking about. Calamity came suddenly, broken, and that without remedy. This, this is language that occurs a number of times, especially in the prophetic literature, of there not being a remedy, of there not being a cure. Proverbs 29 and verse 1. Second Chronicles 36 and verse 16 says this, They mocked the messengers of God. They despised His words. They misused His prophets until the wrath of God arose against His people till there was no remedy. Right now there's a remedy, isn't there? Right now there's a remedy for sin. The remedy for sin is repenting of our sins, falling before God, Desiring His mercy. There, there's, there's a remedy for sin right now. But there's coming a day when there'll be no remedy. There's coming a day when that which is broken will remain broken, cannot be repaired. Numbers 32 and verse 23, Moses reminded his people, be sure your sin will find you out. The tares can grow with the wheat, but ultimately the tares will be gathered into bundles and burned, according to Matthew chapter 13 and Galatians chapter 6 and verses 7 and 8. One final passage, the lesson's yours. Psalm 140 and verse 11. The psalmist said this, Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. We've got to be careful about sowing spiritual dandelions. We've got to be careful uh, that we don't create more work for our Father. That we don't create more work for those whose job it is to get rid of weeds. I often think how much easier the job of preaching would be and how much easier the job of shepherding would be and how much easier other jobs would be if people weren't sowing spiritual dandelions. And preachers could spend their time working on sowing the good seed of the gospel rather than pulling up weeds. And if elders could spend their time in trying to care for the sheep and care for the flock rather than having to spend their time dealing with the problems that sometimes they do, let's make sure that our part in the kingdom is trying to get up the weeds and making sure we don't spread them, we don't make matters worse. I went yesterday and bought two bags of fertilizer, weed and feed. I put it off, didn't want to spend the money, but I decided it was this year or no year. I decided if I don't do it this year, it may not be any use doing it next year. Sometimes we get to that point. We get to that point physically, sometimes we get to that point spiritually. And so, in, in your life, it may be tonight that you've reached the, the point where you realize, if I'm going to get rid of sin in my life, it's got to be right now. Because sin's just multiplying. You let a dandelion go in your life and you don't deal with it, you'll have two and then three and then ten and then a hundred, and before you know it, they'll root out the good. Don't let that happen. Deal with them right now through the power of the gospel, through doing what God's instructed you to do as far as dealing with these problems in your life. We invite you as a child of God tonight to repent of sin in your life, confess it, ask for God and your brethren to forgive you of it. This lesson has primarily been designed for those who are children of God. It may be, though, that there are some here tonight who have not yet made that decision. If that be the case, then you have sin in your life that it also takes repentance to deal with. 
But in addition to repentance, it involves believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, making a confession before men. And instead of prayer, it involves baptism, so that your sins can be washed away. Acts 2 and verse 38. Tonight we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.